So welcome to this little video here. We're going to look at the best way uh, to lock down your Zoom settings. Uh, first, you're going to be logging into Zoom, and that's what we've done here. And you're going to click on Account Management under Admin, and then click on Account Settings. This is for anyone who's overseeing meetings. Uh, it's the best way to lock down your meetings to make sure that you can run the smoothest meeting possible. You want to go ahead and start each uh, meeting with host and participant videos on. So you see I've got those checked here. And I'm hitting the locks to make sure that those can't be changed on a meeting to meeting basis. Uh, then as far as audio type, telephone and computer audio, you want to keep that on as well. Join before host. Um, this is really up to you. I like to keep it off. Uh, what this does if I keep it off is uh, it makes sure that no one can come into the meeting without uh, the host being there. They get a screen that says meeting will start soon. If you turn it on before, people can come in and start fellowshipping, but it can also open the meeting up to, for anyone to access at any time. So I like to keep that locked down and have my hosts come in you know, 15 minutes before the meeting starts to kind of open it up uh, for fellowship and then close it down at the end. Personal meeting ID, um, that is something uh, that we don't really need for this purpose here. I just keep it off. Uh, for authenticated users joining, I also keep this off. This would be a way uh, to go ahead and lock the meeting down if you wanted to, to make sure that people had to have a Zoom account. But uh, for our purposes, we've been leaving them open. Watermarks, we don't need to worry about. We keep all of those off. And uh, Zoom meeting is the meeting topic. We keep that off as well. So here for requiring a password, um, this is actually really important. If you want to turn on password, you're going to want to turn all of these on. And that's going to go ahead and create a password uh, that is required to get into the meeting if you really want to lock it down and make it a closed meeting. If you're going to do that, you want to uh, decide whether or not you want to enable the meeting link um, to have the password in it. Uh, some people have been leaving this on. We're not using passwords on my side, but if you turn this off, then people can't just get into the meeting. They have to actually enter the password to get into it. So it's up to you. And then same here for uh, joining by phone. If you're going to be using a password, you should re require people who are joining by phone to also use the password. And then probably want to turn this off, uh, meeting, you know, not having to use the password if joining the meeting from a meeting list. Um, this is an internal Zoom list, but just to be safe, if you're using the password, go ahead and turn that off. Uh, and then this one is super important mute participants upon entry, turn this one on, lock it down, make sure that people as they come in are muted. Most people will forget to mute and this helps ensure that it's not just constant distraction coming in and out. The calendar integrations, Office 360, meeting reminders, um, OAuth, this stuff is related to some business functions that we don't really use for our meetings. It would be best to turn on encryption here. On the chat side, uh, we like to leave this on, but we like to prevent participants from saving the chat. This is really a, a thing to preserve uh, anonymity. So you can go ahead and leave it on. Uh, that way people can conversate and can exchange information. But by putting on uh, the one-on-one -on -one chat uh, underneath it, people can then exchange their phone numbers in one-on-one -on -one chat instead of publicly in the open chat. So by not being able to save the chat and by enabling one-on-one, -on -one, you can help preserve anonymity uh, through uh, making sure that people can't save this and, and get sensitive information. We're turning off auto-saving chats. Again, we don't want to save those at all. And for playing sound when participants join or leave, you definitely want this off. Otherwise, you're going to have a huge distraction every time someone comes in or out of the meeting. File transfers. I've noticed some people are leaving this on. I've been turning it off. Um, some people have been sharing PDFs and the, the readings and all kinds of stuff through file transfer. It's up to you. This can be used to share uh, you know, information that you may not want shared in the meeting. So I tend to keep it off for that reason. We don't need uh, to send feedback to Zoom. Adding a co-host, though, is super important. If you've got a moderator, you've got um, co-secretary, something like that, they can help you control the room. So we always put that on. And then polling, uh, we haven't really needed in our case, um, but you can ask a survey to the attendees if you want. We do absolutely want to make sure that the host can put attendee on hold. This is one of the only ways that you can block someone or kick someone out of the meeting if they're causing a disturbance. Uh, we've had to do this um, with some trolls and some of the recent meetings that have come in with audio and video uh, that is, is meant to disrupt the meeting. So we're able to put them on hold, which essentially removes them from the meeting. I like to always show the meeting control toolbar. That way, whoever's moderating always has those um, active and available. And then we like to turn off uh, show Zoom windows during screen share. Screen sharing is super important that that's only for the host. You don't want participants to have access to that. If you do, they can screen share at any time. And that can either be disruptive um, or offensive, uh, depending on who is sharing and what they're sharing. So we like to limit that to the host. 
and then we uh, lock this down so that you're not accidentally sharing your desktop if you do do a screen share. Annotation, whiteboard, remote control. We don't need these for our functionality. These are, again, more business functionalities that we don't use. But the nonverbal feedback uh, is super important. This way people can easily find the way to raise their hand and offer other things like uh, clapping and, and um, even asking someone to wrap it up. And then allowing removed participants to rejoin. You can keep this on. Um, this one can be a little dicey. If you accidentally remove somebody, they won't be able to rejoin. Uh, but it can help if you're having a huge problem with people disrupting the meeting uh, that are not there for the purposes of recovery, that when they're removed, they can't rejoin uh, that particular meeting. So I'm going to start turning this on, I believe. Um, but, uh, you know, it's up to you how you want to do that, uh, of course, for your individual meeting. Uh, moving down, we've got breakout rooms. This could be interesting uh, to use if your meeting is very large and you want to segment it out into a bunch of different smaller meetings. Um, we're not using this, but but that's what it could be used for. Uh, I'm also leaving on remote support for our meetings so that I can give a one-on-one -on -one sort of remote support with another participant if there's any kind of issue that they're facing. Closed captioning, um, we've been keeping this off because it does uh, it does require you to manually close caption or add a device um, that is running the closed captions, and most of us don't have that. It would be a great piece of functionality to have if you've got somebody who's willing to translate that. But then we want to turn save captions off, far end camera control off. We don't need to control other people's cameras. Group HD video, we've been leaving it on. If you have a bad connection, you might want to turn that off. Uh, and then virtual backgrounds, we've been leaving on as well. We think it's fun. It can be distracting though, so it's up to you. These are these are more preference stuff. And then identifying guests in the meeting. Uh, we don't need to do this. Again, this is more of a business function. Really, everybody's a guest. Uh, An auto answer group in chat. We don't have this functionality. Um, we're not using you know user groups in this way, so there's no need for it. The peer-to-peer -peer connection, while only two people are in a meeting, more of a technical thing. Might as well leave it on. Uh, there's no no real harm in it. And the rest of these, um, sending email invites, Outlook, DSCP, uh, allowing users to select audio uh, uh, sources. We don't really need to adjust these. They're, they're more preference things or business related functions. I like to turn attention tracking on. This can be helpful uh, so that you know who's actually paying attention to the meeting. So if someone's raised their hand to share, but they're not uh, actually paying attention to the meeting, it can be super disruptive if you call on them to share and then they don't realize it and they're off doing something else. So I keep this on just to be able to kind of see who's paying attention to make sure the flow of the meeting doesn't get stopped. A waiting room is also a really interesting idea and no one can actually directly enter the meeting. Um, this can be helpful to control the flow into a meeting, especially if you've been dealing with disruptions. But again, I would leave that up to each individual meeting. Join from your browser link is super important to keep on. This uh, allows people who maybe don't have the Zoom app or first time using Zoom to access the meeting directly from their browser. So you wanna turn that on. And then live streaming of meetings, uh, you want to go ahead and turn that off, uh, most likely, unless you're live streaming this somewhere, but um, that sort of goes against the, the anonymity piece. Allowing Skype business client to join Zoom, no, no need for that here. We're all using Zoom or, or the web browser. And then I turn off all notifications here because uh, it's just a, a, a lot of notifications if you don't turn it off. They're just coming in every time something happens, and, and uh, that's not really necessary. Additionally, you want to make sure you're blurring snapshots on the task switcher for iOS. Um, that way you're hiding any potentially sensitive information. Um, the meeting scheduler for others, um, the CDN, Zoom support uh, reports, we don't really need these. I keep the CDN on um, just to help with the load uh, of that the meeting is taking on the network. Now, recording, this is a super important part as well. You want to turn all of this off. These uh, recovery meetings are meant to be anonymous, and this goes against those traditions and, and uh, those principles, right? So we lock these down. We make sure that no local recordings, no cloud recordings, no automatic recordings, um, that no one can access the cloud recordings, even if you know some were accidentally created somehow. No one can download those crowd, uh, uh, cloud recordings. Um, but what I do leave on here is the ability for hosts to delete them, because if something were to somehow get created, I want to make sure that the hosts can go in and delete those recordings. Then I also want to make sure that we're auto-deleting any uh, recordings after a day. So again, if something happens to get recorded somehow, it's deleted. And then I want to make sure that we can't recover deleted items from the trash, so that way they can't be resurrected. We don't need recording consent and we don't need um, audio notifications of recorded meetings because we're not recording. 
Then on the telephone side, uh, the toll calls, uh, you can turn this on to generate some international numbers. Um, this may or may not be helpful depending on your meeting format. Most of these meetings are, are video, but you can turn this on. You can get a list of additional numbers uh, that you can share out depending on your location. Third party audio, not really uh, something you want to mess with, but this is super important. The mask phone numbers in the participant list. If someone dials in, you want to make sure that their number is masked so that you're not giving out their number. So again, an, an uh, anonymity portion there. Now, by doing this in account settings under admin, this sets it up so that for every meeting that you start and for every user in your Zoom account, these are the defaults. And then if you've clicked the lock, it locks them down. As you can see here, I go into my personal settings and I can't change these because I've locked them from the admin side. The ones that are available for me, setting passwords and whatnot, those I can mess with um, if needed. And then if I go into a meeting, I'll open up uh, this meeting here, which is now an inactive meeting, but you'll see down at the bottom, some of these settings are very meeting specific. So if I go in and edit the meeting and edit the series of meetings, and I scroll to the bottom, you'll see uh, there are locks here. Uh, I can't turn off starting with host or participant video, and I can't turn off uh, muting participants upon entry, but I would be able to turn on some of the other functionality. So that's uh, setting up the meetings and setting up the Zoom system and the admin to make sure that all of these settings are really dialed in for uh, your um, anonymity and security and to make sure uh, that we're not recording and have the ability to remove people who are being disrupted and aren't there uh, for the reason uh, to get sober, right? Aren't there for recovery. Uh, in another video, I will demo how to uh, mo uh, moderate a meeting properly and how uh, to go ahead and set up meetings and make sure that you're recovering a host ID in case you get locked out of your account.